Do them. Okay, students, well, welcome back. Here we are once again in the course, in the Master's in Molecular and Cell Biology, the course in Bioethics at St. Thomas University, always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O Lord, send forth your spirit, and we shall be recreated, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Speaking of the forest, I was out there with my students this morning, and you know we have the Summer Research Institute going on, and um, I'm happy to report that we finished the first phase of our of our summer research. We got a couple of phases to it, but the the first phase is, uh, well, you're familiar with campus, so you know where the School of Business is, right? The Gus Machado is our, near, is our newest building. And right behind it is the forest. So that sector that was right next to the building, we cleared that last uh, Christmas with other students over the Christmas break and made a clearing there, restoring, just leaving the uh, slash pine on the palm, the sable palm. And uh, we've been working, then I have another sector that is in the middle of the forest, I'm calling the core sector. And that one is full of, uh, it's got the baby pines, the one that has the flags, the little flags with the, with the, um, uh, the ones that have uh, germinated since last uh, summer actually, so it's been one year. And when we cleared that little sector there, we discovered over 3,000 baby pines. Okay? And so oh. the idea was to make a corridor between the business sector and the core sector, which is in the middle of the forest, as you know, is diagonal. It's kind of, you know how the building, the business building is, is actually slanted on a side, right? Sideways. And if you do a perpendicular line, imaginary perpendicular line from the business building, you end up in the core sector there. So that's the corridor that I've been working with my five students, Chaffee's termites. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been going through all the invasive plants in the middle there on the understory, focusing mostly on Brazilian pepper tree, uh, but then everything else that was on our way, including some overgrown natives like uh, muscadine, vine, and greenbrier. So we've been tunneling our way through and finally uh, this week we broke through and now uh, from the core sector you can see the school of business all the way through. Okay, so that's at least maybe two, three blocks worth of the corridor. So that's the completion of phase one. And to celebrate with my students this morning, with my undergrads, I went, we went to a little plot that I have over here near the science building and we rescued some uh, pine seedlings that have been growing there for the past few months. They're nice and small like that and all full of life, green life because it's been raining so much, right? Uh, but eventually the lawnmower is gonna go through there. So we rescued those and now my students, each one has about five or six uh, seedlings <laughs> that uh, is theirs to keep. We're keeping them in the chicken hawk area for now so for them to get the natural light and the, mm -hmm. and the natural rain. But uh, very, I was very happy this morning that we were finally able to make that clearing. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever you're on campus, uh, take a moment at least to go behind the Gus Machado there in the turnaround, mm -hmm. right? And get off for a moment and look deep down, you'll be able to see from the gus, I was hoping that we could see the little flags of the baby pines because there are so many, there are over 3,000 flags there. But um, there's too much ground cover, especially the grass, the African grass. So the line of sight is kind of high. We can see the building from over there looking this way because the building is, right. is huge. Right? River is... And we can see it above the grass, but looking down on the flags, it's hard to see them. Mm -hmm. uh, this way looking out uh, and yet it's the same view one way or another I mean it's the same distance right the <laughs> same corridor yeah so maybe when we cut down the grass a little bit we'll be able to see the actual flags from the gulls that's the idea 
And now the next uh, phase is to start widening that corridor to either side, left and right, make it wider and wider so that we have a fuller view of, of the restored forest. Anyway, a work in progress, but we're very happy this morning that uh, we, we broke through finally on the tunnel, <laughs> on the corridor. Mm -hmm. Okay, and always an open invitation for any grads who want to come and work in the forest and lose some weight. I think <laughs> I, I will. You. I think I actually will. Yeah, guarantee you, you'll lose some weight. <laughs> it's, only, it's only on Fridays or? No, no. So I'm out there in principle Monday through Friday, 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Okay. Monday through Friday, 9 to 12, because generally it's running less in the mornings. Okay. But uh, yeah, Monday through Friday. Now this Monday happens uh, to be the, the July 4th right. official holiday. So we're not meeting this, this Monday, but from Tuesday forward, Monday through Friday, 9 to 12. Sounds good. Anytime. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Let's go forward. Uh, we're still in this area of healthcare bioethics, right? And this is a group, it's a cluster of issues that we're gonna cover today. and generally they are under the heading of a maternal fetal medicine, all right? Maternal fetal medicine, which is uh, one of the <clears throat> new areas, kind of new in medicine, looking at the human embryo and the human fetus as a patient, as a medical patient, all right? And I'll tell you some of advantages, uh, that uh, definite advantages of clinical, medical advantages of looking at uh, the fetus as a medical patient, all right? Okay, so first, uh, some techniques that have come up on the horizon, again, because the technology keeps advancing, right? And we have these two contrasting bioethical systems, uh, principal bioethics or utilitarian bioethics, and uh, uh, forever technology keeps moving forward and there's a whole issue of it can be done, right? And what happens when we don't control technology, then mm, there is something called the technological imperative. The technological imperative is that uh, if we don't control technology, technology will control us. In other words, uh, it's anything that can be done will be done sooner or later. That's, that's the technological imperative, okay? Anything that can be done will be done sooner or later. Never mind the, the may, never mind the should. Should it be done or not? Again, as long as it's legal, you know, many people are thinking in these terms, uh, if it can be done, it's gonna get done. It's gonna be done, all right? I keep in mind also the link here between technology and economy, right? because these technological advances typically stimulate certain sectors of the economy. In fact, uh, I don't know if you are investing in the stock market or not, but uh, I don't recommend it. If people get cleaned out when they go <laughs> invest in the stock market, unless you really know what you're doing. But one of the high returns in, in, in the market is what is known as biotechs, biotechs, biotechnology companies, which are doing research, experimental research, advancing, pushing the envelope forward, for example, uh, using messenger RNA for developing a vaccine. That's totally novel, had never been done in the history of humanity. And, uh, you know, you can develop a vaccine in one year instead of 10 years, for example. So that's a definite advantage, right? And you can imagine the mega box that can come in with that kind of technology once it gets implemented. So biotechs typically have a high rate of return, but they are high risk. They're high risk because the experiment may work or not work. If it works, then the stocks go through the roof. But if it doesn't work, then they take a plunge and everybody loses, all right? So obviously that's the market, right? Higher risk, higher return, but it's, it's risk. So anyway, they say about the market to diversify, to have most of your stuff in a conservative base that grows very little, but it's stable. And if there's dramatic change, like a, a pandemic or something like that, they get hit very little. 
and so it's stable. But you get a little return, but at least you don't lose. If you go on the high tech stuff, you have an opportunity for big return, maybe 200, 300%, 400% return on investment, but you have a chance of losing it all also. Okay, so anyway, uh, these uh, techniques are being driven by sophisticated technology. So there's a lot of investment into them in the background. Mm, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. It's kind of a shotgun. So we're gonna look at specifically at these four issues, uh, three parent embryos, human animal chimeras, human organs in animal models, and finally fetal medicine uh, and fetal surgery, okay? So let's go with the first one, three parent embryos. It has to do with mitochondrial diseases and it's in the plural because it's a cluster of diseases that affect the mitochondria. Now you're all into biology, so you, I don't need to uh, dwell into this too much. What, what is the function of the mitochondria in the cell? ATP generation. Exactly, recharging ATP, right? Adding phosphates, ATP goes down to ADP to AMP. Every time a phosphate is lost, energy is released. That energy is used for doing work, which we call in the cell metabolism. All the thousands of different pathways uh, and by the way, metabolism is subdivided into two types. When it's building molecules, it's called ana, ana builds and kata ana breaks down. <laughs> Anabolism and kata. Anabolism is building uh, molecules, okay, pathways. And breaking down stuff is catabolism, all right? Catastrophe is the breaking down of something big. <laughs> all right, so. The mitochondria, as you know, are in charge of recharging ATPs. When there are these mitochondrial diseases, which is a cluster of them, then the mitochondria don't function at the optimal rate. And therefore, what's the typical symptom? What's the typical phenotype that one will get out of this? Like fatigue and... Exactly. Tired, anemia, fatigue, right? Or maybe not exactly anemia, but fatigue, they don't recharge enough ATPs, person feels tired, weak, etc. All right. And then also some specific metabolic pathways may be affected too. Therefore, uh, now it makes a difference if it's the man or the woman going to the gametes, which has most of the mitochondria, the egg or the sperm. Think of cytoplasm, which has more cytoplasm, egg or sperm? The egg. The egg, the ovum, right? The ovum is a full cell with its, all, with its cytoplasm around it, but the sperm is basically just a nuclear capsule. It's the nucleus and then a membrane and a flagellum, the little tail. And it does have mitochondria in it because that sperm also needs to metabolize, needs to stay alive and function. And many of the mitochondria in the sperm are actually concentrated at the base of the tail, at the base of the tail because of the flagella, because of the actual motion. That tail is burning a lot of ATPs when it's wiggling around, all right? And therefore, the, the, most of the mitochondria in the sperm are at the base of the uh, tail where the tail is attached to the cell itself. Uh, however, <clears throat> When the, when, and when the egg and the sperm fuse in fertilization, we know that, remember that process, the nucleus, the pronucleus, the male pronucleus, the nucleus of the sperm is poured into the egg, all right? And then syngamy, when the two pronuclei fuse to restore diploidy, restore the diploid number, but also a little bit of the, the cytoplasm that's inside the sperm does get spilled into the egg. So there are a few mitochondria in the zygote that come from the father, but the vast majority of mitochondria in the zygote come from the mother, right? Because they are in the egg, which becomes the zygote when that egg is fertilized. So the cytoplasm is the same. The cytoplasm of the ovum and the cytoplasm of the zygote is the same cytoplasm, right? 
So most of the, most of the mitochondria are maternally inherited. And by the way, they have their own DNA also, right? mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA, which goes mostly for the structure of the mitochondria. And, uh, but there are a few have been discovered, a few maternal mitochondria in the zygote and therefore in the organism as we grow. In our cells, we may have a few mitochondria from our dad, okay? But the vast majority of our mitochondria in every single cell are from our mom. They're maternally inherited, and that's why one can trace the matrilineal line, right, phylogenetically with the mitochondrial DNA. Mm -hmm. And it can be traced all the way to the first human, which, by the way, is called what? Scientifically, biologically. Mitochondrial Eve. Exactly, mitochondrial Eve, all right, which is not the same as the biblical Eve, but it's an analogy, it's a reference to the first female human from which we all derived <laughs> anywhere between 200,000 to 2 million years ago in Africa, okay? And then, because it's an equal opportunity world, right? And we men don't wanna be left out. So what's our equivalent of tracing the patrilineal line? We can do that through our fathers exclusively because what do we get from our fathers? Why? Y chromosome, but only who gets it? The men, the male. Mm -hmm. So on the male side, so we can trace, we can trace our matrilineal line, both men and women, because we all have mitochondria in us. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, for men, we can trace our patrilineal line, only for men, through the Y chromosome. And so the first male human is called, therefore, Adam. Y chromosome Adam, Y chromosome Adam, okay? And at some point, Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve met and made it, and the rest is history. <laughs> the rest is the three, the, the eight billion people that we are today. All right. So these diseases are debilitating. They're not uh, necessarily life-threatening, but they're chronic. And therefore, uh, if they can be avoided, that would be a good thing, right? How do you avoid that? In the case of the ovum, what's diseased? What's pathological? If we, let's say structurally, we divide the ovum into two parts. You got the nucleus, haploid nucleus, right? Pro nucleus with a haploid number of chromosomes. And then we got the cytoplasm. So what's diseased? The nucleus of the cytoplasm of the ovum. The cytoplasm? The cytoplasm, because that's where the mitochondria are. Yeah. That's the mitochondria. So this is kind of reverse of the cloning. In cloning, we enucleate the ovum, right? And we keep the cytoplasm, which is healthy and intact, and we put a somatic nucleus. So the mitochondrial disease is, is the reverse. What we want to ditch is the cytoplasm. In other words, we want to keep the nucleus. What do we need? We need a healthy cytoplasm, a healthy female cytoplasm, a healthy ovum. From whom? From a second woman. So this is how it's done. There are two methods. Method one is the embryo repair, and method two is the egg repair. Either one, there's no sequence to this numbering. But uh, this, this is the simplest case here on the left. We have a mother who has mitochondrial disease, right? This mother in red here, or a woman, a woman in red. Uh, then we have her husband, supposedly, or the male who's going to provide the sperm. And then we need a healthy woman to supply an egg, an ovum. Healthy meaning she doesn't have mitochondrial disease, all right? What are we gonna to do to her egg? They chat the nucleus, because mm -hmm. what we're looking for is a healthy cytoplasm. So we enucleate this egg, the healthy egg, we enucleate, ditch the, ditch the pronucleus. 
from the mitochondrial disease woman who wants to have a normal child, we take the nucleus, which is healthy because mitochondrial disease is in the cytoplasm. So we take the nucleus and that nucleus we insert into the enucleated ovum of the healthy woman, of the donor. Follow? Okay, so in effect, what are we doing? We're ditching the deceased cytoplasm of the woman who wants to have the child. Follow? Because it's her nucleus, so that's her genes. And this other woman is just the egg donor, all right? Now, in method one, before ditching those nuclei, there is fertilization. So what's involved here? In vitro fertilization, right? Because these eggs have to be manipulated. So this is IVF. Both techniques imply IVF. So in the first case, the deceased eggs the mitochondrial eggs, right, are fertilized. And the donor egg is also fertilized. In other words, we already have zygotes here. We have zygotes. Then we ditch the nucleus of the healthy cytoplasm and we collect the nucleus of the deceased uh, zygote and use that nucleus to put it into the healthy cytoplasm. But that nucleus is already diploid, all right? It's a diploid nucleus. And then that zygote is incubated three or four days at 37 centigrade, and then inserted into the woman for attempted implantation. So you can see that in vitro is in here all the way through, okay? That's method one. Method two, there is no fertilization yet. First is the nuclear swap, okay, the nuclear swap. So it's actually what I was describing earlier. Uh, the woman uh, with a healthy egg, take out a nucleate that. Now we have a healthy cytoplasm. The woman who wants to become the mother has the disease. We only use the nucleus, which the nucleus again is healthy because it's a mitochondrial disease. And that nucleus is inserted into the healthy cytoplasm of the other one. So we reconstitute a ovum, an ovum, right? We reconstitute an egg made by two women, the cytoplasm of a healthy woman and the nucleus of the mitochondrial disease woman, right? That will give us a healthy ovum which is then fertilized and then incubated and then the blastocyst implanted, okay? So those are the two possible techniques. Obviously, IVF is involved in all of this, uh, but bioethically, uh, they're not the same. They're, they're both unethical, but uh, when you think about this first case, embryo repair, when we take out that nucleus from that cytoplasm, since that is a somatic nucleus, that is already a zygote, we are in fact killing that zygote. Also, when we nucleate this zygote, that kills that zygote, and then we manufacture a third zygote here, which has the nucleus, somatic nucleus of one uh, person and the cytoplasm of the other person. Okay, so at the end, this involves killing two zygotes and manufacturing a third zygote in the lab, all artificial. On this one, the attack is not directly on the zygote itself, all right? The attack is more on risking the hyperovulation of these two women, which is necessary to obtain the eggs. But at least on this one, the fertilization comes after the reconstituted uh, ovum. Mm -hmm. So it's only one zygote involved here. And 
So the unethics on this one is more on the issue of hyperovulation over here. Also, the fact that it's in vitro fertilization, the fertilization is outside of the body. And the third is the risk of the abortions by not implanting, all right? So again, they'll use the three to four ratio thing uh, to, to etch their, their bet into getting at least one implanted, all right? So many of the things of IVF apply. But at least this one also involves one embryo, one zygote, as opposed to this one that actually involves three zygotes. Anyway, that's a three parent embryo. Mm, again, it was, um, the UK seems to be a leader for the past 40, 50 years in this whole in vitro thing. And this is one more spin off from in vitro technology. On the utilitarian side, of course, they see it and they say, well, this is very pro-life because this mitochondrial disease mother can now have children without mitochondrial disease. And it's true, but what's involved? The involved is that human embryos are manipulated, human embryos are killed, uh, and therefore on principle bioethics, not justified, on utilitarian bioethics, another noble prize. Okay, so that's three parent embryo, let alone the child that will be born, who will be born here nine months later, okay? My dad, fine, this is my dad, but who is my mother? I have a nuclear mother and I had a cytoplasmic mother, right? Why is this one the mother and not this one? This could be the mother and this could be the donor. They're just placing the value on the genetics, right? But what I'm saying is the cytoplasm is as needed as the nucleus for the development of any zygote of any cell. Not to mention that this one man is fertilizing two different eggs from two different women. So again, depends on where you stand, utilitarian or principle. In principle, of course, not justified in utilitarian. The end, getting this woman a healthy baby will justify whatever means as long as it's legal. So there we have it. Okay. Human animal chimeras. This came up actually uh, five years ago now. It was just before the last, uh, the previous pre pre presidential elections. And as you can see in August of 2016, just prior to the elections, because it was not known who was gonna be elected then, and if there was gonna be a shift in policy between the two parties and so forth. So NIH put out a memorandum and actually a survey to see if they could lift a ban or a moratorium on human animal chimeras. Okay, so human animal chimera, is uh, a mixture of cells from human and from non-human. The typical non-human is another mammal. Uh, it could be the mouse, or it could be the rabbit, or it could be the primate. All right, but these are research animals. And essentially they were going after two types of organs. So, You've heard about the Human Genome Project, right? Human Genome was to decipher the entire genetic code, the, the genome of the human, the three billion base pairs of the human genome. That started in 1990 and went on for a decade. In 2000, they were 99.99%. There were sequencers going on throughout the whole world in labs, many different labs. This is an international collaboration to decipher the human genome. And in 2000, they were 99.99%, all right? But when you take that 0.001% of 3 billion, there's quite a few million base pairs still missing, <laughs> uh, which could be coding region. 
what is the what is the percentage of coding region, by the way, on the human genome? On the three billion base pairs, what percentage codes for proteins? In other words, has genes? Approximately. It's maybe a fraction of a percent, is it? Well, it's pitiful. It's about three percent. Three percent. Okay. 3%. Right, so the other 97% of the human genome is what people refer to as junk DNA. Junk DNA, genetically speaking, because it doesn't code for any amino acid, for any protein, there's no triplet code there. All right, 97%, 97% of the three billion base pairs is nonsense. All right, nonsense meaning there's no code. Uh, but we don't know yet if it plays a role precisely at the higher order structure and the three-dimensional folding of chromatin or the chromosomes and so forth. So the fact that it doesn't code for anything doesn't mean necessarily that it doesn't have a function, all right? So junk DNA is a little tongue in cheek, but uh, the point is that that's uh, one of the things that was confirmed with the Human Genome Project, that only about 3% of the human genome has coding regions. Uh, Anyway, that was a big project, and then they needed an extra year to finish it, which they did. And now it's published, it's online, it's NCBI there. You can go online for free and blast it and do all kinds of research on the human genome. Which, by the way, how many subjects were sequenced? How many individuals? So it's not the whole population, right? They didn't do the 8 billion people that we are on Earth impossible. So what's the sample size of the human genome? What's the magic number for statistics? One, hundred. A hundred. A hundred is a magic number in statistics simply because it's a very convenient number. So if you got 90 out of 100, you've got 90 percent, etc., etc. So a hundred is kind of the standard sample size. But it depends, you know, if, if the whole population is 200 zebra, then 100 is significant because that's 50% of the whole population. The sample is 50%. But if three, if it's 8 billion people, 100 people is peanuts, it's minuscule, all right? Anyway, it was 100 people that were selectively chosen throughout the world <laughs> to be the uh, sample for the Human Genome Project, <laughs> okay? Craig Venter being one of those. You, you know the name Craig Venter? And uh, Fra how about Francis Collins? Come on, guys. Francis Collins is yeah. head of NIH to this day. Yeah, yeah. Been there at least, I think he's been there at least three administrations. I think it was uh, W, George W. Bush, who put him, put him at the NIH. Collins, by the way, is the one who got uh, the whole project to, to finish the human genome. All right. Very talented uh, person. Hmm. Anyway. Um, so after the human genome, you know, scientists didn't want to get bored, so they needed another global project. So they did the proteome, the human proteome got in there, and I think that's still going on. I'm not sure, to be honest with you, but to try to classify and decode all the proteins and polypeptides of, uh, the, of the human metabolism. But now, what's the big project going on now? The human brain. Again, it's an international collaboration. Uh, the Human Brain Project is going on, it's global, and it's trying to find out as much as possible about the human brain, all the way from the biochemical composition of the brain, functionally, structurally, uh, cognitively, all the way into psychology, into sociology, into philosophy, into spirituality, all aspects of the human brain. <laughs> Okay, it's a big, big, huge project going on right now, the Human Brain Project. There's just one small detail, one minor detail. How do we experiment with the human brain? Right? We need consent and it cannot be harmful to the individual, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, NIH and other labs throughout the world were looking for a model to be able to experiment with a human brain without having to deal with a human individual, with a human being. And that's why the human animal chimera, 
right? They wanted to grow essentially, like it says here, a substantially, substantially human brain in a non-human. A substantially human brain in a non-human. Here it is. Substantial contribution to animal brain, substantial functional modification to animal brain. Right. So it's starting to sound kind of yucky to get a human brain in, in a non-human animal with cognition and so forth, you know, because you can never tell, you know, where do you stop? <laughs> you can't tell the brain, well, just do biochemical metabolism, but don't really think like a human, all right? And all of a sudden, this human brain is inside a pig or something like that. Okay, so that was one. The other so, one. Hmm? Uh, no, I was just wondering, like, how is that? Because there's also the matter of like um, the, the the morphology of the skull and like the brain case and all that. So like, yeah. how right. does it work? Okay, so what they want to do is they want to, the first stage was just to do it at the embryonic level to see if they can actually get a substantially human brain growing in an animal embryo, just for starters and then stop, they will not take that embryo to term, right? And just they want a proof of principle. If that works, then they'll figure out how to enlarge the cranium of that animal to encase the human brain. But you can think of it, if the brain, if the human brain is pushing outward, that skull is gonna start to enlarge, all right? Anyway, uh, they wanted to lift that moratorium. And then the other one, it's always with the reproductive stuff, all right, reproductive stuff. Again, we know, frankly, that sperm is cheap, easy to come by human sperm, but what is expensive here is to get human eggs, human ova, beginning with the consent of the hyperovulation and risking the woman's uh, health and life and so forth. So they wanted to grow human organs in a non-human animal, uh, reproductive organs, but especially ovaries, to get human ovaries, right, uh, to grow in an animal so that they would have a source of human eggs without having to bother any woman. Mm -hmm. So essentially like a factory of human eggs in, again, a pig or, because the pig happens to have a similar metabolism to ours, including the heart itself is uh, very similar to the human heart, right? That's why the, the pig valves that are used for transplant. Okay, so that started NIH to lift that moratorium, as you see here from the webpage. And that went out in August of 2016, and they were uh, soliciting comments on this from the general population. They have to do this by law because NIH is what? It's one of the two main federal uh, research uh, agencies in the United States with regards to um, scientific research. NIH does human research, medical research, and NSF, National Science Foundation, does non-human research, okay? So those are the two largest funding agencies of scientific research in the world, in the world. When I looked this up, I was curious to see what was the budget of NIH in that year, 2016, it was $13 billion was the annual budget of NIH in, uh, in 2016, okay? 13 billion, that's 13, uh, thousand million dollars. Okay, and that's all tax money. And because it's our tax money, they have to consult with the taxpayers. So they put out that uh, request for comments, whether they could lift this moratorium or not. Thanks be to God, enough people had intelligence to say, no, this is absolutely unethical, should not be done. We should not be growing human brains in animals. We should not be growing human gonads in animals. All right, and so they stopped. However, this is only federal. This is federal. There's nothing to forbid this research at the state level 
or at the private level. They don't have the billions that NIH has and NSF has, but they have the millions from state fund or from private uh, institutions. Like for example, Scripps in La Jolla, California, right? Scripps Institute of Research, one of the largest uh, research uh, institutes in the world. So they went ahead and they wanted to prove the principle that it could be done, that they could get human, grow, human cells to grow in a pig, all right? Here's a reference, it was published in Cell, very prestigious journal. And this is what they did. They got a um, blastocyst from a pig. In other words, yes, in vitro fertilization with a pig. You take the eggs from uh, a sow, is it called a sow, the female pig? Yeah. All right, so you take the eggs from a sow and you mix them with the, uh, I don't know, it's a male called a sire or I don't know what the male is called. The male, I don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyway, it's from the male pig, fertilize in vitro and start the process, get to the blastocyst, as you can see here, okay? And in the blastocyst, human IPS, here are the IPS, induced pluripotent stem cells, right? So these are the Yapanaka cells. In other words, take a somatic cell, undifferentiated to pluripotency, and then inject those cells in the ICM of the pig uh, blastocyst. So you got pluripotency for, for pluripotency. In other words, the reason why did not inject fully differentiated cells, human cells, because they're not pluripotent, they're fully differentiated. And so, but the, but the ICM is pluripotent, right? The inner cell mass. So they put these somatic cells through IPS first, revert them to pluripotency, and then insert them into that blastocyst, into the ICM. So then you got pluripotency for pluripotency on the pig embryo and on the human cells, all right? Here's the actual photograph, the micrograph of the insertion. Here's a site of insertion. Insertion Here is the blastocyst. I mean, this is very, very clear. What is this here? That's the inner mass, right? Exactly, that's the ICM, inner cell mass. It's right there, it's very obvious. The rest is the trophoblast, right? It looks just like a human, it's a mammal. So all, all mammalia blastocysts are gonna look the same. It's all in the genes. <laughs> all right, so here comes the needle, the glass needle with the cells, with the IPS cells of human. You can see them lined up here one by one. You can actually even see the nucleus in the middle. All right, and here is a set of, they're already uh, perforated. They made a little pore, a little hole on the uh, trophoblast to insert at this site and then release the human uh, cells in here, in literally into the, right into the ICM, okay? Then incubate, uh, well, this guy is ready for implantation into the sow and give it a few more weeks. I don't know how long is gestation for, for the pig, but um, they pulled out the little embryo. Of course, they did not take these embryos to term, all right? They did not take them to term. They just wanted to prove the principle of chimerism. Mm -hmm. And here's the actual embryo. And here's a diagram showing, uh, they were labeled, the cells were labeled. So somehow they were able to tell where these cells are. These are the actual photographs, micrographs from the, uh, from the article. So you can look it up and uh, they did it. They did the human animal hybrid chimera in um, 2016 over there at, uh, at La Jolla in the Scripps Institute. So this procedure was done here in the United States. But because 
it's not legal to implant these in a pig having human cells, the embryos were sent to Spain. And in Spain, in pig farms in Spain, the implantation took place. So they implanted the embryos, the pig, the chimera embryos in Spain, because Spain has a lot of pig farms and they know a lot about pigs, right? Ham and all that. So the, the second part of the experiment was done over there because in Spain, uh, it's legal, it's not illegal to implant uh, these chimeric blastocysts into their pigs. They were not gonna be taken to term anyway. They were gonna be euthanized in embryo, but just to prove that it can be done and they did it. So there it is, the technology, technological imperative. If it can be done, it will be done, all right? Now, they did not use federal funds because NIH still has the moratorium, but they use other funds. <laughs> and the point is that they got it done. All right, so obviously these two from the principal bioethics are no-nos, the chimeras are no-no, and the three parent embryos are no-no. There are a lot of ethical issues there that are disrespectful, either of the adults or the embryos who are involved. Different could be growing human organs in animals, all right? Human organs in animal models. That could have some validity as long as there is consent and other provisions in place. Here's one example. It's called the Vacanti mouse. Have you ever heard of the Vacanti mouse? It's done in the late yeah, 90s. Yeah. yeah, okay. So this guy, uh, Dr. Dr. Vacanti, right? He's at uh, UMass Medical School, University of Massachusetts. These mice are called nude mice, nude mice, not because they don't have any hair, okay? They'll be naked mouse but it's a nude mouse because their immune system has been stripped. So these poor fellows, they don't have any hair, they're all bino also, and, uh, but that's secondary. Uh, that's just to keep them clean on the outside, <laughs> right? Um, but they, um, their immune system have, has been stripped, so they're been uh, engineered, hmm? transgenic mice. Here's an ear, see it? But it's growing under the skin of the mouse. It's not bothering the mouse. The mouse is healthy, can eat, and I don't know if he scratches the ear or not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, notice this is just a flap of the ear, okay? So again, it's the whole issue of proof of principle that it can be done. But this is the flap. There's, not, there's no inner ear here. There's no middle ear. There's nothing inside this. There's no ear drum. It's just a flap. It's, in other words, it's a scaffold, probably made out of protein or maybe synthetic, that resembles the ear lobe. Okay, and then that scaffold it was planted, was inserted surgically under the skin of the mouse, and the skin grew around it. So it could be in the future for regenerate. Uh, it's known as regenerative medicine. This type of uh, Procedure, model, protocol, could be. Uh, it could be in the future that we would be able to grow actual organs in uh, uh, an animal model. We could grow livers or kidneys or pancreas, okay? As long as we stay away from the brain and the reproductive organs, because the brain is likely the seat of consciousness. And we don't want a human waking up and saying, what am I doing inside a pig uh, body or a monkey body? And the reproductive organs because they also belong to the next generation, not just to us. It's a double responsibility though. Uh, plus every child has a right to have a human father and mother, not an animal father or mother. <laughs> okay, so, but other organs possibly could be as long as 
Other provisions are in place. The typical provision is going to be consent and also the humane treatment of the animal that is not really hurting the animal in a significant way. Okay. But there's a possibility uh, to grow organs in animal models in the future. Okay. Now, this was a big uh, craze at the turn of the millennium, as you can see from the date. But now, two decades away from this, it turns out that technology has advanced so much, even in the era of nanotechnology and so forth, that it's more promising now to actually replace those vital organs with artificial organs, organs that are actually been constructed in the lab to do functionally the same thing, right? Uh, for example, even the heart, to, because it's essentially a pump. It's a sophisticated pump, but it's a pump. And we have pumps, you know, we have pumps in the, in the pool in the backyard. <laughs> so we've been doing pumps for centuries in humanity. And therefore, technology is advancing so fast that we may not need to deal with the biological factors involved in growing organs human organs in other animals. We may actually construct those organs from scratch in the lab and have the same functionality as, as they have in the human body, right? Kidneys, they're a filter. They're a very sophisticated filter, but it's a, it's a biochemical filter at the end of the day. Okay. Any uh, questions so far? Interesting stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, let's look at the, the fourth issue then, is uh, fetal medicine or fetal surgery. First of all, medicine is by using medication, by using drugs, chemicals, to uh, restore the health of the fetus, of the fetus who has some kind of, a, of a illness or disease. Surgery, of course, is, uh, is an intervention. And it's interesting because that allows us for the possibility of looking at the human fetus as a medical patient, all right? And I can tell you because uh, this was my first dissertation out at, uh, when I was at uh, in Rome doing my first doctorate in moral theology. This was the topic of my dissertation, the human fetus as a medical patient. Back then, this was in the early 90s. It was science fiction. In other words, there was not, uh, it was not being done yet. It was uh, theorized, right? And some people were beginning to write about it and so forth, but it hadn't been implemented yet. It all started more or less with prenatal diagnosis and be able to determine that the embryo has some kind of uh, abnormality, right? And if it can be cured or not, like hydrocephaly, which is excessive accumulation of uh, fluid, uh, water in the brain, doesn't allow the brain to uh, grow normally, or it could be meningocele,s which are openings at the back of the spinal cord, uh, which don't uh, seal correctly in the fetal stage, embryonic stage. There are different uh, anomalies that happened early on that could be corrected. Mm -hmm. And so to look at the fetus as a medical patient is interesting because consider this, from certain aspects, the, the fetus is an ideal patient. For example, there's no hospital stay. In other words, the hospital room of the patient, the recovery room is the womb of the mother, okay? And the fetus is being fed, nourished, and cared for automatically by the mother. So there's no hospital overhead expense on the fetus, on that patient, because the mother is, in fact, the ambulatory uh, hospital, okay, a recovery room. And it's not just the cost itself of the food and the infrastructure of the electricity and everything else of the building and the administration, it's the actual hygiene because it's a sterile environment in there. And therefore, and a hospital room is not sterile, right? In fact, there are the superbugs, right? 
is bacteria that are immune to an increasing number of antibiotics. And those are in hospitals. That's why you have open heart surgery and 48 hours later, they're kicking you out of the hospital because of the danger of being infected by one of the superbugs that lives inside the hospital in the air conditioning filters and so forth. So uh, it's uh, kind of dangerous to stay in a hospital nowadays, even the, the best kept hospitals, all right? So you think about it, it has many advantages. It's, um, it's a cushioned uh, environment. It's floating in amniotic fluid. The cells, the tissues and organs of the fetus are pristine, very tender, and uh, they repair very easily. You make a little cut and that incision is going to be repaired right away because all the cells are very actively reproducing and, and uh, growing new tissue, all right? So the repair is gonna be a quick repair and a full repair done precisely at the fetal stage of that organ, hello? So it has several advantages from the clinical perspective. You look at the fetus as a medical patient. Of course, the techniques are sophisticated, right? And everything has to be in miniature. All the instruments uh, are tiny, but we have the capacity with laparoscopy today. Uh, for example, a, a kidney can be extracted laparoscopy, laparoscopically, the pancreas, the, the, the gallbladder, the other one, the appendix, all that. And the surgeon is actually working a joystick on a computer, watching a computer monitor. And they blow up the abdominal cavity with CO2. And they generate an artificial dome in there. And then they go to town working with instruments. It's called the Da Vinci instrument. You can look it up later. Let's see, looks like an octopus. Uh, at what, what's the explanation behind the name? I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> Look it up. Da Vinci surgery. Yeah. I guess he was a genius in his time. But it's very interesting. It's all under, yeah. See, there's all these arms. And all these, uh, they go in different, uh, here, here's one with all the little probes. One will be a scalpel, the other one will be a light, the other one will be a camera, and it will project it on a screen. So the first thing that happens is they will project it two to 10 times bigger than the actual life size, all right? So uh, Da Vinci is quite interesting in that uh, it's, it's, it's very precise. So they're seeing the entire abdominal cavity magnified at least two, four, eight times larger. So that's already an advantage, right? Little tiny organs will look huge. Uh, also, it's much more precise. The precision is millimetric or micro, micrometric, much more precise than the hand of a surgeon, okay? Uh, so, and it can be sustained, doesn't get tired. It's all on sterile conditions. This is all sterilized, and so on and so forth. So really the uh, technician or the doctor is on a screen looking at what's going on at uh, the surgery that has been done. Anyway, what I'm saying is, yeah. So today the technology is there for performing fetal medicine and fetal surgery, okay? So you gotta do the cost benefit analysis and see what is the issue and if it's worth it. And some insurance does cover it, which is a good thing. In fact, it's considered from the insurance perspective that a fetal intervention is gonna be less costly than an intervention later in life with the person already born and hospital stay and all that. So it's cost effective to do fetal surgery as opposed to surgery on a condition that is chronic that can be repaired in utero or otherwise would be dragged on into the born life of the person. So there's even a journal 
computer medicine, okay? And these are just uh, some shots that I took from, um, uh, they have their annual convention and so forth. This is a few examples, preparing, for example, here, a, um, they're inserting a little tiny balloon to inflate the airway, the trach, I guess, for the lungs. Uh, here is a meningeal seal that I was talking about, all right? Coming out of the lower back, that can be fixed. When you have a parasitic twin that is essentially cannibalizing on the placenta of the other twin, notice how one twin is growing much more than the other because one, there's a, one placenta is uh, parasitizing on the other one that can be cauterized and severed so that now each twin will have its own placenta. Okay. And this is a photograph that has become pretty famous because the first fetal surgery that was done, one of the first, they actually took, so here's the womb, this is the uterus. They excise, see, they cut the fallopian tubes they cut down also at the cervix, and they actually pull out the whole uterus with the baby inside, <laughs> with the unborn inside, okay? Pull out the whole uterus, open, and do whatever surgery, sew it back together, and reattach the three tubes, the two fallopian tubes and the cervix. <laughs> reattach it, and that's the most sewing, all right? It's, it sounds dramatic, but it's actually surgically fairly simple procedure. <laughs> it's kind of a hysterectomy and then a reverse, a reattachment. <laughs> well, it turns out that the surgeon here, when uh, they had done the surgery and were getting ready to close up the wound here, the gap, the little fetus stuck out his hand and grabbed the, in the original photo is the pinky of the surgeon, <laughs> all right? <laughs> it's like, like a handshake or something. I know, but the little fetus just grabbed, just reached out and grabbed the pinky <laughs> of the surgeon, <laughs> totally unexpectedly. And of course, all the cameras went off because they're filming this anyway and so forth. And then it went viral. It went on the internet and uh, so forth. So there, ever since then, it's become kind of a fashion. When a surgeon does this kind of surgery to wiggle their finger, on the hand of the fetus so that the fetus will grab around it. <laughs> so now you see a bunch of these uh, online, but the it's original was just serendipity. It's like so, an instinctive thing the fetus does, it reaches yeah. to... Just grab, right? Uh, just like they, they grab the umbilical cord, they grab their feet and their hands, you know, they're, they're, all, they're grabbing in there, or whatever they can find. And this was a, a, new, a new toy <laughs> to, to play with. Yeah, so this is uh, encouraging because now finally the fetus is getting some respect. <laughs> you know, if the fetus is a medical patient, how can that fetus not be a human being, right? It's a medical patient. And all medical patients have rights and so forth. So uh, <clears throat> I Put it out there so you can see that technology is advancing and sometimes it does advance for the better <laughs> of humanity and for bioethical issues that are actually amenable to a principle of bioethics. Okay, well basically that's what I have for today. These uh, clusters of uh, four issues, there, there are more, but these are kind of the, the main ones that have a bioethical challenge to them, right? The three parent embryos, the human animal chimeras, growing human organs in animal models, and then fetal medicine or surgery, which is already a reality as you saw from the pictures. Uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I can tell you this was just a theory. Okay. 
No questions as usual, just perfectly crystal clear, huh? All right. Yes. No, so be it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so now we have, um, what is this, lecture 14 or 15? I forget. I think this is 15, no? 14. This is 14. Okay, so we got three more to go. And uh, not meeting next Monday, right? We decided. Correct. We have a class on Monday, July 5th. So we'll meet again a week from today. Next is our report, oh, I do have a question actually. Is our report for this one still due on Sunday? For this one, let me see. Well, so you people one more time. I have a full week to correct it. So you wanna do it for Wednesday? We'll put it for Wednesday. That's fine. Okay. That's fine with me because it still gives me Thursday for uh, reading it. <laughs> okay, so let's put it for next Wednesday. Okay. Okay, right. thank you. Okay, don't Very delay good. it. The more you delay it, the harder mm -hmm. it gets. So now that it's fresh, this afternoon, do it. Get it out of the way. <laughs> thank, okay. you for the, and thank you for the lecture. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll see you next Friday. Alrighty, Professor. Okay. Hey, happy 4th of July. Thank you. Likewise. Happy 4th. Stay safe, guys. Okay? Be careful with the rockets. And all yes. Right. Please. Okay. Be safe. Okay. Bye-bye. God bless. Thank you.